Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm surprised that you had the courage to come out of your caves tonight with the uh, full moon in Scorpio. <laughs> Are you all feeling it? Hey, Aaron. So we have another astrologer here. Any other astrologers? A couple of astrologers. Uh, so I welcome your input uh, because we gain insight from one another and I learn as much as uh, as much from you as you do from me. So today is what's called the uh, WESAC full moon associated with the life and death of the Buddha. Anyone familiar with the WESAC full moon? It's celebrated uh, particularly throughout India. Uh, technically because they use sidereal astrology, they uh, consider the WESAC moon in uh, this coming May because uh, sidereally the moon will be in Scorpio in May. I don't particularly follow the sidereal positions. So the moon in Scorpio currently uh, I consider the WESAC moon. And the, um, the moon associated with our experience of feeling at home, welcomed and embodied here on planet Earth, as their most challenging time in the sign of Scorpio. Why would you think that's true? Why would you think that's true? Some astrologers here. Any thoughts on that? It's like it's not, you can't touch it or it's not seen. We're working with the invisible, no matter what's in between. Mm -hmm. And so even the moon that lights, it reflects the light, but even the light that's reflected is not seen. Mm -hmm. Working with mystery. Yeah. Well, we're dealing with the lunar current, which uh, is the current of embodiment. Wherever your moon is is how you bring things into bring things to birth into this 3D mortal world. She, as the mother, is the one who creates the nest. First of all, the home moon, and also in her own body gives your spirit a place to interface or merge with the mortal world and, and take embodied. So that she is connected with the mother principle. And it's opposite to um, Taurus, which is her most exalted place, because Taurus is the sign of incarnation is the sign of Scorpio, which is the uh, sign associated with encountering our mortality. Pluto is associated with Scorpio, and as the great initiator, Pluto actually is the gateway to immortality. So when we meet the limits of our mortal world, Pluto offers us an opportunity to dive deep into our being, connect with our soul and the immortal aspect of our being. So we experience ourselves as immortal beings. Many times those who have encountered a near-death experience, or had a near-death experience, are pulled or catapulted out of this mortal world to experience a life that's eternal. And then being touched by eternity, eternity return to this mortal world transformed. So the moon in Scorpio, Scorpio intensifies everything it touches because of its association with Pluto, uh, intensifies our emotional nature, our emotional being. Anyone have the moon in Scorpio in their natal charts? I know a few who have an intensity about them that uh, really transcends the emotional experience of most other people around them because everything they feel or experience emotionally is at great intensity levels, at great depth. The intensification of the emotional nature gives us an opportunity to explore the entire range of human emotion. So the moon in Scorpio, because of the, the, its association with the underworld, Scorpio, 
intensifies that which lies beneath the surface that needs to then emerge out into the open for resolution and clarification. Things get so intense emotionally that you can't any longer ignore that which has been leaving you as being uncomfortable. And when that when the intensity builds to a point where it erupts from the underworld, then there's the opportunity to understand its nature. So the sun is in Taurus, opposite to the moon. The full moon's always in opposition between the sun and the moon, the great lights. Taurus being the sign of uh, you know, inc incarnation, I associate with the earth herself. The sun being a star, I associate the sun in Taurus with the earth star, the living power of Mother Earth herself, her beauty, her invitation to explore the incarnated world. The reason that Taurus is associated with sensuality, pleasure, beauty, because those aspects or qualities of the mortal world are, are what draw us or attract us to take incarnation, stay in a body. We want to help someone who tends to be out of body a lot, come back into their body, give them a massage, <laughs> sing a beautiful song, take them out for a walk in nature, the natural world brings you back into the incarnated world. So the sun in Taurus is experiencing the beauty and power of being in this world embodied. So you can feel the, the, the polarity between the intensity of the moon and Scorpio confronting her own death versus the beauty and power of the natural world inviting us to more fully embody and enjoy the experience of being here on planet Earth. What makes this particular full moon so extraordinary is that the lunar nodes are in uh, Leo and Aquarius, and any, anyone who knows astrology will notice that it creates what's called a grand square. The lunar nodes are a function of the moon herself. So she, at her full moon, is squaring her own nodes. So this creates a, 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 a point of intensity, powerful manifestation, because the grand square is the greatest um, signature of manifesting uh, in this world. So we're feeling drawn between coming out into the open, Leo, and really being highly visible, versus Aquarius, its opposite, the south node, merging with the collective circle of our friendship, so of, of, of our community, uh, as a polarity, versus our own personal experience of being here enjoying the experience of being here in, in, the, in this world versus the emotional intensity of realizing that there are hidden aspects of our nature that are being deeply uh, intensified during this today and tomorrow especially as the moon approaches Jupiter that uh, give us that highlight the boundary between the mortal world and the immortal anyone who uh, has uh, had the opportunity to take an underworld initiation meets your own meets the limits of your own mortal soul, mortal self, and you realize this mortal world has its own beingness and power to attract that keeps that that tends to capture people in the plane of mortality. So that when during an initiation, that spell that's cast by the mortal world is broken. And that, but that's what call, people call awakening. Mm -hmm. It can't strike like lightning. Mm -hmm. Can't come out of the blue, like out of left field, it's field, especially if Uranus is involved. And suddenly you feel like you've been walking, uh, sleepwalking all your life, and some sudden event just wakes you up. It's usually quite shocking. If anyone, if you had that kind of experience. Or, you're finally feeling like, wow, this is what it feels like to be awake. Mm -hmm. okay. So the mor mortal world has a particular spell that it casts upon us and keeps us entrained in the experience of being bound to our own mortality and everything is associated with 
being safe, secure, and achieving our physical goals. And when initiation reaches its depth, that spell is broken. And you awaken to your own immortal beingness, where you realize that you are the light of your soul is the, th is, the, is the source through which you find your true direction. And then the mortal world, the mortal experience, becomes an opportunity to perfect certain qualities of being that then, as you evolve through your experience in this life, become a permanent part of your soul history. It's not what you do that's important. It's not what you accomplish in this physical world that's important. It's the qualities of being that you develop as a result of those experiences that you take home with you. So all, all of the, all of the uh, worldly accomplishments that most people deem important as hallmarks of success are being challenged right now because of this massive combination of Saturn and Pluto in Capricorn. Mars being in Capricorn currently. How many of you had a particularly challenging and intense April? <laughs> Despite everybody's raised their hand. Yeah, in my last talk I was, I was uh, suggesting this might be just a, one of the most particularly profound and challenging months of our life so far. And we certainly watch this play out on the world stage. <laughs> So Saturn, uh, as I wrote down a while ago, Saturn ruling Capricorn is master and sustainer of a field of experience, the medicine of the manifest world. So he, wherever Saturn is, is, is the avenue through which you accomplish and leave a legacy in the mortal or, or manifest world. He's the one who sets the goal through which you achieve your highest ideals, your uh, path of accomplishment. And then Uranus follows later and breaks up the, the uh, idea of being of individual accomplishment. But through Capricorn, we uh, are given the opportunity to leave our mark, leave our legacy. In the, in the mortal world. It's our career, our goal, or the medicine we carry. Mars has been in Capricorn since March 17th, combined with Saturn and Capricorn, and then Pluto and Capricorn uh, a few days ago. And it was kind of fascinating to me that the day before the Mars-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn, which is associated with the right use of power, particularly by those who are in leadership positions, Trump met, met with Macron the day before, the, the head of France. And then on the day of the Mars-Pluto conjunction, Kim Jong-un crossed the DMZ, the militarized zone, to South Korea, which had never been done before by any North Korean leader, and met with the, the head of South Korea to uh, <laughs> defuse Mars-Pluto can be uh, really powerful uh, demonstrations of uh, explosive power. And Mars-Pluto could be nuclear energy. And so on that very day, Kim Jong-un and, and uh, Moon, the South Korean president, met. And then the day after the Mars-Pluto conjunction, Trump met with, uh, with uh, the leader of Germany. Uh, uh, Angela Merkel. And those two, in the minds of the Western world, are the two leaders who are competing to be the leaders of the Western world, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I was really, it was really fascinated to watch how right around that conjunction, these major events occurred. And uh, these major, these events may seem far removed from our personal lives. Uh, however, I consider world events as dreaming symbols, uh, omens of opportunity that then are as if they had occurred in a dream for me, uh, mirror back to me opportunities in my own personal life of needing power with integrity. That's good. I respect that. Excuse me? 
I said that's good, and I respect that. It's pretty cool. You respect what? The metaphor. Uh, the, the metaphor of using <coughs> world events as kind of like almost as you lose astrological symbols mm -hmm. for science. Yeah. Yeah. Because for, for many of those who awaken on the path, um, our experience in this 3D world becomes a, a dream. Mm -hmm. It's like a, we, we awaken to the dreamlike quality of this, our present experience. And uh, there's a certain quirk of, of human uh, awareness that when you have a dream and you recall that dream, you automatically shift into symbolic consciousness. You realize that all those aspects of what you dreamed are mirrors of yourself. So you don't interpret those dream time experiences literally. You take the time to interpret them. So if you take that same attitude into this world, realizing this is also a dream, then that dream interpretation of symbolic attitude toward events unfolding in your life kicks in also. So the deeper understanding or opportunity of the right use of power is demonstrated by these world leaders making the attempt, at least, to uh, respect one another. <laughs> How far that goes, it's really, you know, that's up to them. But uh, had, had any, any of you actually watched uh, the, uh, the meetings on C-SPAN or yeah, I just saw two seconds of it, uh, yeah. like a half hour ago, before mm -hmm. I came over here. Yeah. They looked like they were on pretty good terms. They was mm -hmm. with each other. Yeah. They were smiling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Which I took to be a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so whenever we're dealing with Mars, we're dealing with a two-year cycle. <clears throat> so uh, when Mars makes a conjunction, it actually, it's not just that day. It's actually the very beginning, the seed point of a two-year cycle of activity. And Mars conjunct Pluto is the right use of power in active manifestation and how we realize our personal goals, Mars. So those symbols of those leaders, at least making the attempt <laughs> to appear respectful to one another, Capricorn, uh, and combine their power for greater achievement, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a goal to which we can aspire. This sets the tone for what's to follow two years later in 2020, in March of 2020, when Mars returns to Capricorn. During the 2020 year, of what's called the Capricorn Climax, where Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto will all be in uh, Capricorn, combining with one another. And then Mars reaches that particular uh, Capricornian climax in March of 2020 uh, to really bring things to a really manifest uh, conclusion in terms of our historical process. So we're getting a little heads up this month and into April, especially in April, uh, into May, uh, of the opportunity presented to handle power with uh, integrity in a way in which we are responsible for the outcome of our actions. So there's a great deal of accountability with uh, associated with this particular combination. So whenever Mars and Pluto combine with one another, Pluto is actually the Kundalini itself, mm -hmm. the serpent fire. Mars activates the Kundalini when Mars and Pluto combine. So uh, if you, in your own personal life, have had those who challenged your integrity, uh, it, it could, you know, it, you know, there's a possibility on the shadow side of it degenerating into a contest of power. And you find yourself uh, you know, locking horns with those who may not recognize the integrity of your path and challenge your authority to speak from your own personal experience. Mm -hmm. Um, the truth that the higher octave of Capricorn and Saturn is actually your own, the voice of experience. <laughs> you, you are maturing to uh, a place where you realize that your own personal experience in life has opened the door, given you the, the, uh, the right to speak from uh, the experience you've had and the wisdom you've gained from it. The, uh, the most 
important and ultimate source of wisdom is direct experience. So whenever you've gone through an experience in your life, you've gained from it, you, you actually accrue a certain inner authority. You'd be able to speak from that experience and the wisdom you gained from it. So the, the key here is that where, where you may feel the contest of power is that you're speaking from your own personal experience, the wisdom you gain from it, and the person you're speaking to cannot hear you. They don't recognize the wisdom you gain mm -hmm. and the personal authority that you have achieved through your own direct experience that may add value to their life. So <clears throat> that's really where we then are uh, given the opportunity just to put more weight down on the voice of our own experience and realize that that is the source of our personal authority. Uh, the shadow side of that is feeling like you need to go to the right school, have the right degrees, be recognized by the right people who are in authority to uh, be taken seriously. <laughs> Because wherever Saturn and Capricorn are involved, there's a certain serious quality about it. It's your standing within our culture. It's, our, it's your standing within the community. It's uh, it all starts with dad, you know, and not being respected by dad in your own personal authority. So wherever Saturn and Capricorn are involved, we're always dealing with father power, father energy. We've all been experiencing this since 2008 with Pluto and Capricorn. Is just being highlighted now. Uh, a big punctuation mark being put on it um, with Saturn, the ruler of Capricorn, having entered his own sign, now approaching uh, Pluto in 2020. So, um, have any of you had particularly uh, uncomfortable confrontations uh, where your integrity was questioned this last month? Most of you seem to uh, be pretty settled in your authority here, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have a couple of other astrologers there. Any questions or, or comments on that? Or anything to share? Or are you just following along? Okay, okay. it feels it's like it's been a very inward um, challenge of my own recognition of my authority. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. yeah. Because Saturn is retrograde, right? What house so. does it tr transit in? <clears throat> is it at the bottom of the chart that it's drawing you in? For me, mm -hmm. um, it not necessarily like in my chart, but mm -hmm. that seems to be the key. Is if it the experiences dealt with within. Or like Eric's saying in the in the dream world, like seeing it mm -hmm. as a dream and working with the energies. Like my mm -hmm. experience has been then when I'm with other authority figures, they are seeing me. Mm -hmm. It's not easy internally. I'm in a total battle and feeling everything you're talking about, but externally it's actually been more like like you were using the word promotion. Mm -hmm. Like I have Mars and Capricorn in my natal chart, so Right. It's like yeah. this exaltation that inwardly I'm like, ah, like, mm -hmm. you know, like totally having this inner battle thing, but I can resolve it enough to then speak from experience and then it it flies because I'm in the right avenue. Yeah, when that, so you just confirm what I was just saying about referring back to your own personal experience yeah. as a source of your true authority. Like, I'm not speaking yeah. about things I don't have experience about. There you like, go. if I go into politics or I go into mm -hmm. some right. kind of big business or things that I don't have a lot of experience in, then mm -hmm. I'm going to flop out. Yeah. Be. Yeah, in those areas, you become an apprentice to others who have had personal experience in that arena. Yeah. And you acknowledge their authority. That's why it's gone well. I yeah. Think, I think, and it's been very humbling and very challenging mm -hmm. because... I didn't always feel like I was getting what I thought I should be getting, but yeah. when I acknowledge like the business owners or those who are working with the money systems or whatever, mm -hmm. where I don't have my as much experience in that, right. I, I would verbally say, commend them for what they're doing and mm -hmm. speak about it, and then they would give me a higher position as mm -hmm. well. 
Right. It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but internally, it's been really challenging. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, Capricorn, Cap Capricorn, particularly with Mars and Capricorn, uh, in your natal yeah. chart. That's mm -hmm. zero degrees. Uh, the question of what mm -hmm. is worthy of accomplishment is always a key question that is central to your life. Because once you set a goal, Mars and Capricorn, that goal becomes your master. And you serve that master until that goal is accomplished. So you can be very careful about what master you choose in setting that goal because once you do set that goal there's no turning back and you just like you know everything in your life is given to achieving that goal or serving that master so the, the question answering that question of what's worthy of accomplishment is a big part of this capricorn climax mm -hmm. and how we can um, set a goal that's worthy of our our soul worthy worthy of our uh, true purpose so once we set that goal, we're not serving a false master. In order to achieve recognition, standing, or acceptance by our society, which is a big part of the shadow side of Capricorn. Okay. So it feels all good if I if there's not a like you're saying if there's there's a like there was a personal reset of my Mars energy the last number of years. Mm -hmm. So people are able to renegotiate their path and what they're going for, what they're reaching out and trying to grab onto, then it would it could go better, I would, I would suspect. Yeah. But when you're aligned with the spirit, you become aware of the inner intent of that goal. And then the inner intent is what you're uh, you give your loyalty to. And the more evolved the person, the less you're attached to the means to which to achieve the intent. The intent is what stays true. But the means through which to achieve that intent that can transform and evolve as you go through the experience of the particular idea of how to achieve that intent. And it sounds to me like you've gotten a lot more flexible around that Capricornian goal in realizing that the means through which to achieve it can change, but the intent is really clear. Spending some time on this because uh, Mars remains in Capricorn uh, until uh, <clears throat> the new, the next uh, new moon on May 15th, which is quite an extraordinary day because uh, oh, <laughs> three things occur on that very day: new oh moon goodness. in Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no more. <laughs> uh, Uranus shifts into Taurus on that very day. That's a new moon? On the day of the new moon, on the 15th of May, and then uh, Mars shifts into Aquarius in that, that evening. So, there's square. so it's quite an extraordinary uh, shift of energy. The Uranus will enter Taurus, um, make its first foray into Taurus, enter back into Aries briefly, and then not fully enter Taurus until next year. But that always indi uh, indicates a significant challenge, uh, shift in the forward momentum, because Uranus is always connected with the wave of the future, the wave that sets the future possibility in motion. And what's really fascinating is that throughout the first week of May, um, Uranus will actually return to California's Uranus. Uranus, California, the state of California, has Uranus at 29 degrees of Aries. And uh, you will be uh, experiencing the first of a threefold Uranus return on May 12th. And uh, this Uranus will return back, go back and forth over its Uranus and its Pluto, because it has Uranus and Pluto in the last degree of Aries. Uh, throughout this year and into um, March of 2019. March of 2019 is significant because it's usually around that time, it's meant that uh, the uh, presidential election really gets underway with the selection of the uh, Democratic uh, con uh, contender. Yeah, that's usually February, March. So 
we have this uh, extraordinary window of the awakening of California as a transit, as an awakening for uh, not just the United States, but for the rest of the world. And this almost looks like a secession here of California from the rest of the nation, where we just uh, start running with the ball, basically. And uh, with Uranus and uh, then entering Taurus, it looks like the, the female wave, the wave of, uh, of uh, women's liberation and empowerment will really begin to get underway. And then by uh, the spring of 2019, fully begin to emerge. Uh, Uranus actually returns to California's uh, Pluto and Uranus in November of this year, retrograde which is the month of the elections, and I anticipate that, you know, with uh, the signal already being sent and the women, more women running now than ever before, <laughs> November elections will be the first indication of the coming wave that will really get underway in March of 2019 fully. So we're, we're in a transition year. That one's Gerardo's retrograding back out of Taurus. Yeah, yeah. Because okay, so we will have had we will have had the taste of the feminine energy already. Yeah. This summer. Well, starting Before starting May starting May uh, right. Right. May fifteenth, Uranus enters Taurus. It kind of peaks over the horizon into Taurus, then goes retrograde back into Aries briefly, and then by uh, the spring of next year, of twenty nineteen, it will fully enter Taurus. Chiron and Aries, as I mentioned in my last talk. Uh, just started a new 51-year cycle of new medicine. Oh, yeah. Chiron uh, in Aries, the last two cycles, were marked by the women's liberation movements. You'd think Aries was ruled by Mars to be connected with men. Mm -hmm. It's actually the females, the women, finding their young aspect. Mm -hmm. And uh, because 1969, uh, the feminine mystique was published which uh, a book that really started the whole women's liberation movement when Chiron last entered Aries. And before that, it was the women's uh, suffrage, suffrage movement that led to the women's right to vote. Mm. So that, that's also adding fuel to this uh, empowerment of the female coming forward. Um, and Chiron will actually retrograde back into Pisces uh, for a few months in the, at the end of the year, and then fully in our Aries also in 2019, in February 2019. Uh, so we're seeing we're seeing that this is a transition time. Today and tomorrow is the peak intensity point of this challenging April that we've all experienced in a contest of power, realizing our own true power and standing firm in the truth of our being uh, as the moon in Scorpio waxes, uh, it has uh, reached fullness already just before the talk started, and uh, will uh, combine with Jupiter at uh, just a, right, right around uh, noon of uh, next uh, Monday at noon at 12, 11 p.m. So usually uh, at the full moon. The full moon actually is a point at which we achieve full consciousness of the cycle that started two weeks ago. And if you follow astrology, the midpoint of any particular combination of planets that are in aspect is where the resolution of the energy is released. And to get a little uh, into the weeds here, <laughs> the full moon, anytime there's an opposition, and that Exact exact point of the opposition, the midpoints actually shift to the other side of the chart. They go go from the personal expression, which is the first two weeks, personal e evolution, to the opposite side of the chart, which is then sharing what you've achieved on a personal level, what you've realized fully at the full moon, increasingly over the next two weeks as this disseminates the energy out into a wider circle. So. At the full moon, the energy pops and starts releasing outward, which is really beginning now. However, because Jupiter is in later Scorpio, the intensity level is still building until noon tomorrow, throughout the night, uh, 
we are having our emotional bodies, our astral bodies, intensified mm -hmm. so that that which has been submerged beneath our consciousness, which we've tried to ignore or hide, <laughs> can't help but come out into the open <laughs> and uh, yeah, be acknowledged, experienced, understood, and released. What's the greatest way to actually uh, address a fear? Face it. Um, I would say not giving it energy by resisting it. Listening to it. <laughs> when you when you're not resisting it, that's good. That's an initial step. You're not ignoring it. You're not trying to push it away. The next step beyond, beyond not resisting it is actually listening to what that fear has to tell you. Fear then becomes your ally, it becomes your teacher, your witness. Mm -hmm. And and when you when you're able to achieve separation like that, where here's your fear, you're still fully experiencing, but you're also listening to it. You know, you're not fully engaged. You're not overwhelmed by it. It's not determining your reality. In that state, then you can actually enter into a dialogue with your fear and you enter into a deeper state of listening, where you receive the, uh, you, 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 you hear what fear has to say to you, what fear has to tell you. And it's usually connected with your own mortality, not feeling safe in this world. With the, with the moon and square, wherever the moon is, is where you feel safe, where you feel protected, mothered, embraced, and nurtured. However, the moon of Scorpio in the underworld is saying, oh, you know, <laughs> uh, I am a mortal being, and ultimately I will die in this to this mortal world. How do I deal with that? Can I listen to death as an, ad, as an advisor? Can I hear the immortal? Can I shift then to the immortal soul that I truly am? and witness myself enmeshed in the mortal world. And all the challenges and opportunities are, that go along with it without being fully overwhelmed and identified with it. That's the key to the emergence from the underworld of greater wisdom and understanding of the opportunities presented by being in this mortal world. So if things, wherever Jupiter is, is a teaching. That's your path for the time being, for that particular period of time. And Jupiter being in Scorpio, he is on a hero's journey because he's, pre he's in a sign preceding his own, Sagittarius. So he himself is looking for greater depth, passion, and understanding of the true nature of reality by being in Scorpio and diving himself into the underworld. So the moon combining with him is like giving him added emotional uh, breadth and depth to expand his understanding of the nature of this mortal world and its opportunity. And by uh, <clears throat> then May 1st on Tuesday at uh, 8.19 a.m. the uh, moon breaks through into a uh, clear blue sky the Sagittarius and uh, the insight, the wisdom, the understanding of our journey through the underworld begins to open up. So during this period of time through the next today and tomorrow, uh, stay present and uh, uh, it just kind of, this reminds me of this little bird I've been watching, um, <laughs> a, a, little, a little chickadee, you know, black head male. He, uh, hops up on my car to where my rear view, uh, the outside mirror is, mm -hmm. and he's like jumping up. I, I didn't, I couldn't figure out for the longest time what he was doing. I realized he was, he was shadow boxing with his own reflection <laughs> in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> you know, being a male, he's protected his territory without realizing he was fighting with himself <laughs> with an imaginary foe. And I says, wait a minute, the universe is trying to tell me something. <laughs> This is totally Moon and Scorpio, you know, where you can really get <laughs> drawn into battling with an imaginary foe mm -hmm. and not realize you're dancing with yourself. 
So I make sure uh, during an underworld initiation not to take anything personal <laughs> and to uh, be aware that others who are less conscious than I am may be shadow dancing to an extreme degree mm -hmm. and uh, attempt to draw me into their shadow boxing mm -hmm. experience. Um, I, I won't, uh, you know, I, I just won't allow myself to be drawn into contests of power because the moon Scorpio can be very psychic and the primary uh, experience of this emotional portal is on the psychic level. Uh, there can be, you know, it, it, it can also be called a witch's moon because many times the um, women of power who uh, have been initiated into the, the blood, the deeper mysteries of the blood, uh, through their own menstruation, the red tent, mm -hmm. that's all moon and Scorpio. And it's the power of uh, female psychic awakening. Uh, the sorcery associated with you know, the power to influence psychically beyond the uh, awareness of another. And that can be uh, used or it can be abused. So there's a lot of that going on <coughs> during um, whenever Scorpio is involved, particularly with the moon, because the moon is associated with the astral plane. So there, there may be some pretty powerful astral warfare going on right now that anyone who is sensitive, psychic, and aware uh, can pick up uh, on and feel like you're, you know, the universe is picking on you or focused on you with, not, you know, with less than divine intent. But once you're aware of it, you realize, oh, I see you. I'm not going to take this personally. You're shadow dancing, dancing with forces that you're not aware of, and uh, I just won't be drawn into it. So how many of you are really clear through your own experience that you are an immortal soul? So the moon in Scorpio during this portal is an excellent time, opportunity for you to deepen that awareness, gain perspective about the nature of those or that which is trapped in the mortal world in uh, contests of power because they haven't yet awakened to their own soul in contact with the mortal aspect of their being, their true nature. You can have great compassion for them, but just be uh, aware of their own shadow dancing and not be drawn into um, contests with them because the, those trapped in the mortal world can really get into contests of power with this one, uh, which we're witnessing on the world stage. Go ahead. Uh, you were saying with this one, I was wondering, uh, in the real stage, um, what are you referring to, or a particular person or everyone? Um, there, there's a general contest of power going on in the world since uh, Pluto went into Capricorn. Well, how long ago was that? In 2008. Hmm. And throughout Pluto's uh, transit through Capricorn, <clears throat> and then particularly with the world the Capricorn climax in 2020, uh, the uh, the worldly intent to unify the world under a single command, um, a, a single world power. You know, some call it the New World Order. But that that intent is there to uh, for a particular group of people or individual uh, to seize control and. When, when it sounds negative, but the underlying intent is a unifying one. Even those who are abusing power are attempting to achieve a unified state. They don't know how to do it through love, which is the ultimate unifying power. So when a person of power is disconnected from their soul or from the power of love itself, the only way they know to achieve unity is to dominate. And, and even though uh, it's, it's, they're working against themselves, there's a certain kind of unity that's created by a dominant figure. Everyone unifies around that figure who's dominant. So it creates the appearance of unity, which is the intent of power over others. But because it hasn't awakened yet, it works against itself and winds up to find, find itself undermined and isolated ultimately by someone else who comes up behind them and um, tries to dominate them. 
but you can watch this play of those who are have lost contact with their own soul or haven't awakened to their own soul yet, uh, competing for the kind of unity, the only kind of unity they know, which is uh, power over others. And that's primarily the culmination of the history of civilization at large, which has dominated uh, Mother Earth for thousands of years because of the uh, central core of the human race not having awakened to their own soul's destiny. That's changing now. That's, that's the uh, there definitely glimmers of light uh, individually and in and, and groups of people now who are soul connected, who uh, are attempting to achieve and understand the means through which true unity can be achieved, a true unifying element, which is the power of love underneath the intent to bring unity, bring all of mankind together. Uh, religious spirits have attempted to create a certain kind of unity through dominating the souls of millions of people. They create the appearance of unity through religion, but then again, at a great cost to the human soul. So we, when we understand that those who are lost in the matrix have the same intent of bringing about unity, but because they're disconnected from their own soul, only uh, the only way they know <laughs> is in the mortal world is through being alpha male or, or female to uh, dominate others and bring them together into a common goal. It's like the football coach you know, coming in and rah, 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 we've got to win this game. It creates a certain kind of unity amongst the players, but it's true. A kind of dominant role that uh, the mortal world uh, recognizes as successful, as uh, important, as something to be respected. When a person can't gain the respect of others or love of others, uh, then they're tempted to become dominant mm -hmm. in order to uh, have power over others to guarantee or secure their relationship to them because they don't trust they haven't come home to the depth of themselves and realize the beauty and power of their own being and its inherent capacity to love and be loved. The only option remaining is to be dominant. So you, once you have this perspective, then you can watch this being played out in the world without getting drawn into it, without uh, also polarizing against it or having harsh and judgmental attitudes toward those lost in the matrix even though you know that healthy boundaries are definitely required mm -hmm. in order to uh, make sure that you are not uh, personally uh, drawn into a battle that's not your own. Yeah. So I've kind of, this is the whole underlying issue, humanity's attempt to come home to itself and unify mm -hmm. that is being played out through this uh, building Capricorn climax really coming to a head in 2020, and then realizing there's a greater, uh, there's a greater depth to which we need to come home to ourselves before that true unity can be achieved, and a civilization, a way of being with one another as a human race can be achieved under, uh, in, in a sustainable way <laughs> that really honors and respects the true nature of our being. Go ahead. Um, in terms of unity, speak up so we can hear you. Between now and 2020, in terms of unity, what are the aspects that are supporting diversity, like that are just supporting soul expression? So, like I think technologically, we're at a place where our greatest potential for unity also is in decentralization, which supports diversity. And I'm curious what what energies will support diversity in that unity. So it's not like a, a homogenous transnational unity, but it's like the unity of the soul, which also has space for all the individuals to be unique and diverse. Yeah. So what are what are the energies between now and 2020 that are 
playing out in support of that unique, like the uniqueness of each being and of the diversity of like our soul's ecology as we come into a culture of unity in that diversity. Mm-hmm. Can you speak to like what, what's playing out in that arc between now and 2020 as well? Um, when the heart awakens and your soul, con- when you make contact with your own soul, the natural consequence is you realize or recognize the beauty of your own being. Once you recognize the beauty and uniqueness of your own soul, you can't help but recognize the uniqueness and beauty of other souls around you. And not just accept them, but celebrate their uniqueness. So the natural consequence of the opening of the heart, the awakening to the soul, is a diversity that emerges from it, where each the uniqueness of each being is not only accepted and embraced, but acknowledged and celebrated. And you notice that whenever you're around heart-centered people, that's what happens. You don't need to even think about it or uh, have it as a goal. It's a natural consequence of your heart being open. Would you say that's true? Mm-hmm. So when I, the, the, the long dialogue I went into earlier about power over others uh, in the unawakened soul uh, tends to try to impose an idea of what's required to create unity. Uh, Just like a a certain certain kind of unity that's created by soldiers marching in cadence. They are uh, dominated by the person in charge and then told to operate in a certain way which creates a certain kind of unity, a cadence that can bring down a bridge. But that's the that's the unawakened form of unity. That's Saturn and Aquarius, actually, in the unawakened way. But the the catalyst for uh, this unity and diversity is the awakening of the soul. With, through whatever means you're directed to do so, and many are being directed to awaken to and deepen their contact with their own souls through various opportunities that are being presented presented uh, through the medicines of this uh, planet. Uh, and when you have that, when you get clear about that being your inner intent, then the means through which to achieve that intent, higher forces than, that are above our pay grade can hear you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you just watch how opportunities just seem to emerge mm-hmm. that were completely beyond your personal ability to imagine. <laughs> Whoa, you know, there is there are definitely other energies here that are far above my pay grade that are involved with this process. And I just need to remain present for the opportunities as they arise. Have the inner intent clear. I'm crystal clear on the intent, but the means to which to achieve that become magical. And it's a magical journey that continues to surprise you as the uh, answer to your question unfolds. Is that clear? Okay. <clears throat> Go ahead. I was just going to, I think maybe I was wondering if she was looking for what kind of movement in the, uh, in the relationship of the planets, and perhaps stars might be, mm-hmm. exhibit the evolution she's hoping for. And I was wondering, might the movement of Pluto through Capricorn as it finishes its transit through the sun mm-hmm. and moves into Aquarius? Might that be somewhat of a parallel to the, perhaps the evolution she's referring to? Uh, that's possible, um, because the uh, the U.S. Constitution was actually written and envisioned uh, in, with Pluto and Cap in Aquarius. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Aquarius is the unifying document. But however, um, we have gone so far beyond any of the well-known celestials. Since, yeah. uh, since the turn of the century with all these new celestials being discovered, Varuna being one of them, which enters Leo in June, the return of the Sun King, that it seems like everything is up for grabs. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's almost like uh, the impossible is becoming possible. And our futures are just completely unpredictable. Mm-hmm. Because so many new el- celestials have appeared with uh, the other gods being drawn in also beyond the Western imagination, that uh, we are just uh, really left with the experience of a magical unfolding 
that all and it asks of us is to be present with the opportunities as they arise. Have a clear intent. Have a goal in mind. Have a great plan in mind, but hold to it lightly, <coughs> because what will be the trigger is the others who show up in your personal world, who then, through combining their energies with yours, create opportunities you couldn't have personally imagined for yourself. So uh, just stay alert to who and what shows up in your world as an opportunity to spin a new world into being. But in the meantime, <coughs> recognize that the world is exactly where it needs to be. Everything is an opportunity in the present moment. Don't allow yourself to unwittingly go to war with the world. As uh, your discomfort you know, tempts you to uh, stand in contrast to the experience you're having, rather than dancing with it and listening to what this worldly experience has to tell you as an opportunity to awaken so that the future becomes an invitation. It's not something that's forced on you any longer. It's not forced in a particular direction. It's a not constantly unfolding dance. Any of you do ecstatic dance and you wind, you wind up with a, with a partner on the dance floor you hadn't met before, their moves trigger new moves in you and you learn all, all kinds of new ways of dancing. Of moving in the world. That's the uh, that's the magical way in which this unfolding process will really become a living reality for you, is to learn how to move with the opportunities presented. But uh, Pluto going into Aquarius will be a major uh, a signature opportunity because not only will uh, Pluto have made a return to the U.S. Pluto, Pluto's in the U.S. chart is the last degrees of Pluto, uh, Capricorn. Um, we're, we're having what's called the, uh, the long sextile between Neptune and Pluto, repeating itself from the 50s through the uh, 60s <coughs> that offered a tremendous period of opportunity from in the, from the mid-20s to the early 30s. That's that'll, this called the long sextile, and from that point onward, it approaches the quintiles. Neptune and Pluto always deal with the overlying opportunity of the human race to evolve as a whole and their relationship to one another. So in the mid-20s, once we get through this uh, Capricorn climax in 2020, uh, Is that when we'll Pluto? really start opening up uh, all kinds of possibilities we can't imagine right now. I was just wondering when Pluto transits out of Capricorn. Uh, 2024. Uh, 2022, I believe, is the um, Pluto return of the United States. And uh, have any of you uh, become aware of this new celestial Orcus that's been discovered? And, um, do you have anything to say about Orcus? It's not really yet. Um, that it feels very aligned with energies of Pluto. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. There's a, there's a, feels like a homecoming kind of energy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I can't say much else about it. Right yeah, the, the orbits of, of uh, Pluto and Orcus go kind of like this. Like they're the same, almost the same uh, <laughs> orbital phase and interlock with one another like this. So Orcus becomes like the, almost like the treasure that Pluto offers uh, um, to Dive into the underworld. Yes. Orcus delivers the treasure. It's the it's the consciousness you're talking about. Yeah. Like I'm hearing it through other people. Like when you when you find your soul, when you connect, mm -hmm. the astrology changes everything. Like we're finding all these other celestials because yeah. the collective consciousness is mm -hmm. remembering. And then like the Capricorn, like the Mars and Capricorn, it's like it wants to make money and have control over mm -hmm. others, but then when you start to get to know who you really are, mm -hmm. then it's more like about love or about just mm -hmm. everything you've been yeah. saying. So it's like Orcus feels like, like I love that, the treasure of Pluto, like to go yeah. to the depth of the core. Mm -hmm. of your soul earth, purpose. And yeah. your soul, yeah. Orcus, uh, Orcus is connected with the soul purpose uh, that Pluto reveals. Um, 
what's interesting and fascinating to me is that the United States of America is experiencing its first orchid's return, mm -hmm. like a fourfold orchid's return. Orchid's going over the same position that it was in when the United States of America was born. And orchids was just recently discovered. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> so so orchid. So not only is the United States of America going to its Pluto return, which was discovered in 1930 in the early 20s, right now, between this year and next year, its counterpart, Orcus, to Pluto, the soul's purpose or treasure, is having its fourfold return. It started last year in September. Just, uh, you know, just on, the, on the, the cusp of Orcus being first sighted by the human race uh, and identified, but, which is pretty fascinating to me. <laughs> is Orcus part of the uh, Kuiper Belt? Yeah. It's one of those Kuiper Belt objects. Neptunian object. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a Neptunian object. And where in the sky would the Virgo seen first uh, Virgo. It's in Virgo, yeah. And uh, nine degrees of Virgo right now. And the U.S. Orcus uh, is nine degrees of Virgo in the ninth house. So uh, that that to me is kind of mind blowing. Mm -hmm. this, this reminds me of uh, a perspective I've developed on astrology. It kind of addresses what you're referring to around the trend of decentralization. It's been happening through our culture for the last couple of decades, really. And it's, um, I think in 2003, I believe it was, is when the first trans Neptunian objects, you know, Kuiper Belt objects were discovered. I think Kuar, and there was, like, there was a couple of them there mm -hmm. that, that were discovered. And then it was speculated that we would eventually find one that would be bigger than Pluto. And so the whole question. Right. Of Pluto becoming, you know, reclassified and all that emerged right. in 2003. Mm -hmm. And then years later, then they found Sedna and they said, okay, Pluto's now no longer a planet. It's a, you know, an object. All, all that happened in the astronomical world. Yeah. Um, and Eris. ever since then, we've, we've been discovering more and more and more of these trans Neptunian objects in the Kuiper Belt. Mm -hmm. It's really been kind of like recontextualizing Pluto as just one object in this big band yeah. of objects. Mm -hmm. My interpretation of that is that, that beginning with 2003, is that you know, by that time the internet had really just reached its maturity, mm -hmm. and other technologies like Napster and peer to peer technology were just emerging that were setting the stage for things like Bitcoin and all these things. There's been a long progression of decentralization technologies that's, that's you know, the, kind of the undercurrent of what's happening in our society mm -hmm. that began emerging in the early 2000s, right at the time we started discovering all these objects. So the way I think of it is that Pluto, before that time, Pluto was. Considered, you know, the only, yeah, the only thing kind of holding this central position of, of all its power right. and evolutionary force as Pluto, mm -hmm. and then it went through this gradual process of being literally decentralized and mm -hmm. distributed into now is there's this big band of objects that kind of yeah. like take on I kind of think of different <clears throat> aspects of the Plutonic archetype. Mm -hmm. Well, which is a yeah. super complex, like super, super complexity, complex. just like decentralization. Yeah, and so it's it's, it's you know, we're still in it, and we're not. You know, I think it's it's an ongoing thing now, and even now mm -hmm. it's going out into you know discovering trans, uh, you know, exoplanets and other mm -hmm. other solar systems. And all this is that it's yeah. completely taking our center away. Anytime we, we find a center that's just another another node is added to yeah. to the network, and so I think that it, it's a very significant shift in yeah. kind of like a, a trend of of relocating our perception. Mm -hmm. in this way. And also relocating a perspective. With was it Voyager left the uh, left the outer edge of our system? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have a new perspective as well. Yeah. Yeah. What you know, going following that a little further, the decentralization yeah. idea. Uh, Varuna was actually discovered in 2000, and the the, the, the most uh, dominant signature in the 9/11 chart, Jupiter conjunct Varuna. That one year later, after Varuna's discovery, Jupiter was the Varuna conjunction was the dominant signature of the 9 11 chart, mm -hmm. which opened us to the dark side, Jupiter Varuna, mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, fanatical gods attempting to gain dominance over the psyche of the world. Because with these new trans Neptunian objects being excited, uh, uh, discovered, yeah. we ran out of Western gods. <laughs> so Pluto can be a symbol 
of the, the, uh, the, the cultural spell of the Western world being dominant across the world. That's right. Okay. Pluto was a Roman god. Yeah. Right? We ran out of Western gods, so Quoar, Varuna, Sedna had to start being invited into the circle. Exactly. Diversity, okay? Yeah. Breaking the spell of the Western world. Sorcery over the world on a civilizational level. So that we open up to the possibility, or greater possibilities, of these other cultural spells, alternatives to the Western cultural spell, to be included into the circle, and welcomed into the circle, and through their integration, then discover a whole new model of of a Western of a human civilization that can emerge from that recognition of those alternative models. So that's that to me was kind of curious how yeah. we ran out of Western gods and started started having to fight the other gods in the circle. <laughs> yeah. And that's all part of that diversity model that you're talking about, diversifying our consciousness. To become more inclusive of other, of other ways of being in the world, not just on a personal level, but on a global level. So we're getting way out in the weeds here. <laughs> what was what's so interesting too about Pluto being demoted is along with that series, the mother goddess was promoted from just being an asteroid to a minor planet also, along with Pluto. And Ceres was the one who actually was able, had the personal power to challenge Pluto by going into the underworld and redeeming her daughter. And uh, Ceres uh, is actually squaring uh, this full moon axis conjunct the North Node right now, so she needs to be mentioned at least, you know, brought into this conversation of the, the lioness. We have one here, you know, uh, the Ceres in Leo <laughs> uh, roaring and, and ensuring that, you know, her voice is not eclipsed or drowned out by the challenges of the mortal world. Okay. And Regulus living in Virgo. What's that? And Regulus living in Virgo. Yes. A 2180-year age of rulership that has shifted from Leo since the Roman Empire came into being into Virgo uh, in 2011, I believe it was. That's why the uh, you know, sitting right on Donald Trump's ascendant. <laughs> He's 29 Leo, which is the old way of the, uh, the Lion King, uh, versus uh, those who uh, recognize that the greatest amongst us is the servant of all. Virgo. Well, it's the Herculean. It's the Herculean paradigm with the lion. There's two different lion traditions. There's the the lion shamanic tradition and the lion there's the lion tradition of, of co-creation with nature and there's the lion tradition of dominance over nature. So, so that's the, the the bent Leo is really the dominance, but the, the deeper the deeper Leo mm -hmm. is the partnership with nature. The deeper lion mm -hmm. leadership is the partnership with nature. Mm -hmm. So that goes along with what we were talking about earlier in the talk about the, the, the distinction between those who are trapped in the matrix and uh, default to power with others because they haven't connected with their own soul versus those who have awakened to the heart of the soul and uh, are moved from that deeper unity with, within oneself to experience how they are unified with others. I don't yeah, I mean, you can really, like the Romans mm -hmm. broke the covenant. Uh -huh. So it's 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 actually what's interesting about that in Leo is that in the line in the ancient traditions in the ancient African tradition to break the covenant is to lose your soul. Oh, okay. So in that ascendancy of the unconscious Leo, mm -hmm. there was a, a, a dissociation from the true soul nature of the soul, which is to be in communion with nature. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's interesting coming out of the light. It's almost like, you know, like the way that you can't bear, like you can't really see something when it's entirely in the light. Mm -hmm. you know, it has to have a certain degree of containment mm -hmm. in order to be known. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting piece.
piece with that ascendancy of the Leo because like the deeper intelligence of the Leo is to integrate with the soul mm -hmm. and coming forward in our true nature as servant kings as opposed, yeah. to, as opposed to dominator kings. As opposed to yeah, because Leo is connected, associated with the sun. Right. The sun, right? We call it the sun. We've named all the other stars in the universe. And our local star is still the sun. <laughs> I was we, have ask. A, we have an awakened to its true power because the sun is a star. So the awakened Leo awakens to the starlight within. Yeah. That brilliance of your own soul. And the natural consequence of that is to awaken the brilliance of the souls that you make contact with. And uh, create an opportunity for them, for them to share the stage with you and share their light. Whereas the immature Leo, because they haven't awakened the starlight with them, will need to be the focus of attention to gain confidence in their own creative power, which tends to you know, dominate the room. I was going to ask her a question. Um, you said the soul has to die? In, in the ancient traditions of Africa, so I, I go to Africa and I work with teachers of, of Africa and, and the <coughs> lions in South Africa. And in the ancient traditions of Africa, it is it said that when you kill a lion, you um, forfeit your soul. Yeah. Right, interesting. So, which, which also, you know, now includes the karma of all the Chinese who are eating lion bones for their virility. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a massive trade in lion bones out of Africa that is rapidly extincting one of the most important keystone species on our planet Correct. in order to feed the Market. narcissistic desires yeah. of small penis Chinese men who want virility, you know, like who want to like prove their masculinity by obtaining this very um, extraordinary medicine, which mm -hmm. is the lion that's ground up. Which has replaced tiger blood, actually. The tigers are no longer available. What happened so, to rhinoceros horn? It's the same. It's the same, but it's, there's a particularly significant pattern with the lions because it's because they're keystone species. So when when the lion when the lions go extinct, the ecosystems die. Mm -hmm. Period. Um, it's like the wolves in <coughs> Yellowstone. It's like that's what harmonizes the whole ecosystem. Their presence harmonizes the whole ecosystem, which is the equivalent of the emperor being in alignment. Mm -hmm. the, the, the lions are the emperors of the animal kingdom. Mm -hmm. So when they walk in harmony, everything walks in harmony with them. And that's, mm -hmm. that's part of the deeper mystery of distribution and hierarchy coming into harmony in the next octave of human civilization. Is it's mirrored in the ecosystem. It's like we will we will come into when we come into the ascendancy of the soul. There'll be new patterns for <coughs> coherent hierarchy and coherent non-hierarchy, mm -hmm. and that ecology is a mirror for that. <coughs> that also is was recognized in ancient shamanic traditions and is recognized in the stars as well. Um, like when Leo is ascendant but not balanced. It becomes the pathological king. It becomes the. Um, Do you have um, a thought of how the lions can be saved and the energy that's wrapped around with that? Um, I have a lot of thoughts about it, but um, <laughs> the short answer, in a very kind of and on a political level, is that China is still an oligarchy. So if we could create the right chain. chain Campaign, campaign to just a very few people. Like China's not a democracy, so you can't influence Chinese buying patterns from from a, a, a cultural movement. It actually has to in, impact a very few decision makers. So that's a political question that I've actually been working on with some very high leverage people. Um, the, the shark fin trade was changed in other ways. Um, Anyway, I don't want to derail the conversation. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's all a moon and Scorpio. That's a moon and Scorpio conversation. <laughs> dealing with our own personal extinction. Right. Yeah. You know, and uh, survivability. 
especially with Capricorn involved. Yeah. And the image of power. Yeah, the and uh, you know, if you view that from an, uh, from a, a higher perspective, uh, each species, including our own, it creates a pool or a latent op of, uh, potential of experience. And as uh, a spirit evolves, it can evolve from one pool of experience like a lizard would offer. Would offer. It, it, it explores that pool, that, that boundary of experience, that, uh, and then will evolve to the next more advanced boundary of experience, or pool of experience, once it reaches, completes its lizard experience. And when a particular pool of experience has been completely <coughs> explored, that species will go extinct because that pool of experience is no longer needed by a spirit. So on the higher level, extinction can be uh, viewed as, as, uh, as an evolutionary graduation of spirits to a, a, a more appropriate pool of experience through a different species that then offers the opportunity for evolution that's appropriate to a certain uh, whole class of spirits. <coughs> so the whole, you know, the idea of the you know, dinosaurs going extinct, there was a whole class of spirits that needed that experience, explored that pool of experience, exhausted it, it was no longer needed, so that species went extinct. Hmm. I'm not saying that we, in our heart-centered or spirit-directed efforts, to protect and support a species that's being challenged is not is misdirected. But on a, on, a, on a higher level, if a particular species goes extinct, then it suggests to me that uh, that pool of experience has exhausted itself, and a more appropriate pool then will emerge in manifest form for that experience to be further explored. Looking at things from a creator view, I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just my thoughts on that. <laughs> so thank you very much for sharing that, Samantha. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, the middle of uh, May is quite uh, electric because we have Mercury conjunct Uranus uh, just before Mercury enters Taurus on the 13th. Um, is there a square between Mars? And uh, yeah, Mercury squares Mars on the 12th. Mercury, uh, Mars will be in the last degree of Capricorn, um, and then uh, Mars will actually square Uranus on the 16th, just having entered Aquarius, and Uranus uh, just having entered Taurus. So it, it's the whole new wave of awakening, Uranus into Taurus, starts with a bang, because whenever Mars squares Uranus, it's lightning medicine, big time. And particularly since Mars will be in Aquarius, is who is ruled by? Uranus. Uranus. Okay. So Mars squaring Uranus and Taurus is actually looking to Uranus as his guide, and he's squaring Uranus, reminding him of the evolutionary potential of this next wave of awakening that starts in the middle of May with Donald Trump uh, <laughs> going to Israel. And the uh, uh, <laughs> the uh, what is it the um, That's great. the embassy the uh, American embassy being moved from from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem uh, with, uh, on the seventieth anniversary oh, of uh, Israel on May fourteenth all within that window so here's another omen to a dreaming symbol to consider as a signal for the opportunity of this next wave of awakening. <clears throat> Anyone following that? <laughs> Even Trump Zilla is being guided. Is that when Melania will file for divorce? What's that? That's when Melania will file for divorce, right? <laughs> She's got her own initiation. That'll be pretty electric. Yeah. yeah what, what is interesting with this full moon is uh, that uh, the full moon is exactly conjunct 
the moon is Scorpio, the inauguration chart. Mm. When Trump was inaugurated as president, the moon was at nine degrees of Scorpio. Full moon is at nine degrees of Scorpio. So something's going on there in that line. <laughs> Go ahead. If someone has a yacht in their um, mail chart, what is, uh, or yod, well, what is that to you? Or what does that mean? Uh, yod suggests to me a very clear pre-agreement, a sole contract. So when, by transit, that yod is activated, that sole contract is activated. Mm -hmm. And same things, uh, people or events seem to unfold in a destined way that seems beyond your control. But it's not really beyond your control. It's, it's a contract you already made before you were born. You have certain people or events show up that require some adjustment of your way of thinking uh, and your way of being in the world that opens new worlds up to you. Mm -hmm. So if you have a yoda in your chart, you have one. Mm -hmm. And the, you watch a transit over, particularly by an outer planet, be very alert to the people or events that begin to unfold that suggest the nature of the contract you may have made on the soul level with that person or experience. And, and being one particular to, point in the yod that's transited, or particularly the yod? Yeah, any, any time, that, but particularly at the apex point sure. of the yod, or the outcome point, which is opposite the yeah. apex point, is, is then, then the, the opposite point to the apex planet of the yod is where the outcome of that contract is experienced. And uh, so many, you know, if you follow that, follow your transits, once a month that yod is going to be activated at least. You know, to come to the apex planet, and you can become, you know, become more uh, familiar with the process of being alert to who and what shows up to offer you a new way of being in the world that expands your world. You know. mm. Anyone else? What's that? We're over time. Yeah, I was feel I was feeling that. Uh, I thank you for stepping in. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we've gone a little long tonight. But uh, this was excellent. Mm -hmm. The moon just keeps. Yeah, we can be here till midnight. I've gone for three hours or more, so thank you for speaking up. <laughs> With that, brothers and sisters, sweet dreams. Enjoy. Yeah. Thank you.